the morning when I rise in the morning when I rise in the morning when I rise give me Jesus give me Jesus to the church in Colossae. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also into all the world and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Verse 7, as you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ Jesus on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Now, anytime you deal with Paul's writings, uh, if you look in Peter, Peter basically says at one point, I hear you've been reading Paul's writings. And he basically said, good luck with that. Uh, when Paul wrote, uh, now what I just read to you, it's different in, in different translations. But in some translations, what I just read to you is one sentence. There's only one period, okay? So it's kind of hard to figure out everything or unpack everything that Paul is trying to say when he uses so many phrases in, in one sentence. Some translations, it's one sentence. Some translations, it's two. But, but Paul's got a lot to say, and he packs a lot into one sentence. But I want to try to, to break down the sentence for you today. So we're only looking at one sentence today. It's going to take a while to get through the book of Colossians. Remember, Paul had never met the believers in Colossae. Epaphras, the, the pastor, the one who had taken the gospel there, likely he brought the news of their conversion to Paul 
maybe he sent a letter to Paul earlier, or maybe he brought it to Paul while he was under house arrest in Rome. If this is the case, we don't know exactly when Paul found out about the church in Colossae, but we do know that at this point when he's writing the letter, Epaphras is actually with him. Epaphras has come to tell him about the state of the church. But think about this. If it is the case that Paul was under house arrest in Rome when Epaphras brought the news to him of the church in Colossae, think of how it must have thrilled Paul to hear the good news that there was a growing church in a Roman city, a city, a place he's never visited. Proverbs 25.5 says, As cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. This is how it had to have been for Paul. I mean, he's under house arrest. He's not free to, to go and do as he pleases, to travel like he used to. Imagine, I would imagine immediately after hearing of their conversion, Paul was so excited. It was, like, it was like a drink of water on a hot day. It was like good news from a far country, literally to Paul. He was so excited to hear that the work of God was going forward. I think immediately when he heard of these Colossians, even though he's never met them, he immediately started to think of them as, as part of his extended family. Thinking of them in this way, and not a, a distant people in a distant land, thinking of them as his own brothers and his own sisters, led Paul to be deeply grateful for their adoption into the family. Paul wasn't jealous. I, I find this interesting. When Paul hears about these new children that his father has, Paul's not jealous about the new children. Paul is so glad to have more brothers and sisters. When we told my niece that we were having a baby, her immediate response was, ah, I've got enough family. I don't want any more family. <laughs> that wasn't Paul's attitude when he hears about the Colossians. It's not, well, this is going to take attention from me. No, Paul is excited. There's new brothers. There's new sisters in the family. He's overjoyed. He's excited that the family is growing. After introducing himself in verse 1 and 2, he, he begins to speak to them and he says, Look, I'm so excited. He says, I give thanks to God. We, me and those who are with me, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When, when we think of you, when we pray for you, we give God thanks. Now from the, the first day Paul heard from Epaphras of the Colossians' conversion, he began to thank God for them in his prayers. Paul gave thanks to God for them because he knew they were from him. You see, these believers were not saved by their own craft. They weren't saved by their own cunning. But as all believers, they were softly, they were tenderly, they were solely called by the grace of God. Paul knew that these men and women were believers because of the work of the grace of God, of the work of the Spirit in their hearts. Paul understood every believer is a gift from God to Christ. Chiefly, as a believer, you are God's gift to Christ. Remember, Jesus said that the Father has given them to me. Think about this. You are God's gift to Christ, but if you are God's gift to Christ, you are thereby God's gift to the church. And that's the way that Paul looked at these believers. He saw each true addition to the family as a reason to rejoice. And what he was rejoicing in is not just that the family's growing. He's rejoicing in the goodness of the Father that he adopts all these children. Paul didn't question whether their conversion was genuine, and the reason he didn't question that is because their conversion was evidenced by the signs that accompanied it. Now, I'll tell you very plainly here this morning, when somebody tells me, look, I'm a believer, my first, my first inclination is not to listen so much to what they say, but to look at their life. Does their life say what their lips are saying? When Paul heard about these believers, and he didn't just hear from Epaphras, Epaphras that they believed in Christ, he heard from Epaphras that they loved each other. He heard from Epaphras that their faith was strong. It was these evidences that accompanied their belief that made Paul confident. These are true believers in Christ. Notice he specifically mentions he gives thanks to God ever since he heard what? Of their faith in the Savior and their love for the saints. Look at verse 4. He says, we, we give thanks to the Father since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and, and your love for the saints. These Colossians had two aspects of their spiritual life, faith and love, that served as confirmation that they were indeed alive in Christ. Faith in the Son is not only a response to the Word of God, it is a gift given by the working of God. The scripture makes it, claim, it makes it very clear that even our faith has been given to us. It has been granted to us by God. So they have received this gift of faith, and then they have this love for the saints. Love for the saints pre presents clear evidence that the gift of God has been received. According to the scriptures, no, no, this is not me saying this. I've had people tell me. I remember this one family say, you know, we're God people. We're just not church people. Let me tell you something. God people are church people. 
Scripture says this. According to Scripture, those who do not love the church... Now, I didn't say going to church. When I say the church, I mean the body, not the building. The saints, not the structure. According to Scripture, those who do not love the body do not know God. Okay? Look at 1 John 3, verse 10. In this... The children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. So how do you know the difference between those who are true sons of God and those who are still sons of the devil? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. 1 John 3, verse 13. John writes to the church, Do not marvel, don't be surprised, my brethren, if the world hates you. But in verse 14 he says, We know, this is how we know that we're truly converted. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. One of the clearest evidences that you are truly converted, that you have been born again, is that you have a deep abiding love for the people of God. Now this doesn't mean they don't get on your nerves. Right. This doesn't mean that sometimes you don't, you don't wish things that you can't say out loud. <laughs> what it does mean, though, what it does mean is there is just something in you that draws you to the people of God. There is something in you that makes you care deeply for the people of God. There is something in you that makes you want to be with the people of God when they meet. The Spirit of God produces that. One of the evidences of faith, faith is a gift of God. One of the evidences of true saving faith is that you love the people of God. Affection for the church is one proof of saving faith. An absence of affection is a sign that there is an absence of life. Love is, love is like breath to the believer, if you will. The way you know whether you're really, believer, uh, really a believer, you know, you can, you can know if somebody's breathing. You take a little piece of glass and if they're asleep, put it over their mouth. And if that glass fogs up, you know they're alive, right? It's the same for a believer. Love is the glass, if you will. If, if you put the glass over their mouth and the glass doesn't fog up, that's an evidence that they're not really in Christ. Loving the church does not come naturally. It's a supernatural result of regeneration and resurrection. It's not something we've produced in ourselves. It's something that we can't explain that God has put in us. Even when they get on our nerves, even when we disagree, even when we have problems and conflict, there's just something in us that loves them anyway. It's because this is evident in Colossae. Epaphras has told Paul about it. It's because this is evidence. Paul is moved to thanksgiving by the report he's heard. It's abundantly clear the grace of God is active and alive among them. They possess saving faith and it is evidenced by love for the saints. Paul further elaborates in verse 5. We not only give thanks because of the salvation granted to you, procured by your faith in the Savior and producing love for the saints. He says, verse 5, we furthermore thank God for this. He says, because of the hope, verse 5, which is laid up for you in heaven. The hope Paul referred to, the hope that was laid up for them, can't really be reduced to one thing. We think of the hope that's laid up for us and we, we think of heaven. And, and that's certainly true. But the hope that's laid up for the people of God, I think, is really a collection of things. It's the hope of ultimate salvation. Yes, we are saved but we're still being saved. We're waiting on the day of our ultimate deliverance. The hope is a hope of ultimate salvation. It's the hope of resurrection from the dead. It's the hope of eternal life. The hope of redemption of the creation. The hope of so much more. This, this hope that Paul speaks of that is alive in them. The, the, the hope that they're having for that which has been laid up in heaven. It's not just one thing. It's a multitude of things. This was a hope that they looked for but they hadn't yet received. The words laid up in the Greek language communicate the idea of something set aside or put away for one's later use. At this time, Greek rulers would lay away goods for the later use of their faithful servants. It's as if a good servant, the, the ruler, the master, would lay aside almost a retirement fund for him, something to take care of him in his old age. The words laid up are different than our modern idea of lay away. When you lay something away, you are paying for it. This idea of laying up, the master's paying for it. It's not that they're paying for something. This is something that has been provided to them as a benefit. Paul said, you've heard of this hope, of this treasure that's laid up for you. Paul's thanking God not just for them, but notice he's thanking for what they had ahead of them. Again, there's no jealousy in Paul. He is excited about their prospects. Notice Paul says, you first heard of this hope when you heard of the truth of the gospel. Verse 5, read it again. You heard of the truth of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Now the English word gospel is translated from the Greek word uh, euangelion. The prefix you refers to something good, something pleasant. The word angelos is literally angel or messenger. 
So when you combine those prefix and suffix, the word means good message or good news. I, I, I guess I should have realized this before, but I didn't really realize this until this week as I was sitting there studying it. It kind of clicked with me. The word we translate into gospel, you know, that's uniquely a Christian word, it seems like. But it wasn't an invented word by the church. The word euangelion already existed in the Greek language when the church came into being. In fact, the word had both Jewish and Roman uses. In the Hebrew context, when someone used the word euangelion, they were usually talking about the coming of Messiah, the coming of the kingdom. We're waiting for the good news, the, the good word. We're waiting for Messiah to come. When the Romans used the word, they were usually talking about good news from a far land that, that another battle has been won, another area has been conquered. This word has a, a rich background in, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the Septuagint, the Greek translation uh, of the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, this term comes up, and, and there's a basic meaning of the term gospel. It was simply the idea of the announcement of a good message, the announcement of good news. Think about it this way. R.C. Sproul said, If a doctor came to examine a sick person and afterward declared there was no problem, that the person was well, that there was nothing serious, that was gospel, that was good news. In ancient days, when soldiers went out to battle, people waited breathlessly for a report from the battlefield. They wanted to know about the outcome, and someone would be standing on the wall of the city watching. And when he saw a dust cloud out in the distance, and he saw someone running towards the city, he knew if that person was running towards the city, they were coming with good news the battle has been won. But he knew if they were limping, and, and uh, R.C. Sproul called it the survival shuffle. If they were doing the survival shuffle, it was evidence the battle went bad, and we lost. So imagine someone looking out over the city wall waiting and they see that little, that little dust cloud. And as the runner gets closer, he's running hard. They know that he's coming with gospel. He's coming with good news that the battle is over, the battle's won. When Jesus first used the word with his disciples, when the apostles later used this word, they were speaking to people who, added, who had an understanding of what they meant. When they said the gospel, they knew that people understand that meant good news. Though it was in the dictionary before Christ's death, though, the word achieved its truest and its fullest meaning when it first began to be used by the church. The ultimate good news is the message that Messiah has come to redeem man from his mess. The gospel is the message that God has broken into the world and that God is about redeeming the world. That's the gospel. It's the good word, the good news. Paul said, you heard about this hope laid up for you when you first heard the gospel. Look at verse 6 and 7. If I can paraphrase verse 6 and 7, Paul continues when he wrote, The good news has not only come to you, but it's also spreading across the globe. It's bearing fruit everywhere it goes. Just like it did among you when you first heard it from Epaphras, the gospel is growing. It's flourishing. Now, again, we don't know for sure, but it's most likely that Epaphras heard the gospel directly from Paul while he was in Ephesus. Remember, the city of Ephesus is only about 100 miles from Colossae. Paul sent, spent a considerable amount of time in Ephesus preaching and teaching. In fact, Acts 19.10 says that while he was doing that, I don't have this verse up there, but Paul said that he continued doing this for two years so that while he was there, all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So people were hearing the gospel while Paul was in, uh, was in Ephesus and they were going out from Ephesus and taking the gospel to other regions. It's most likely Epaphras heard the gospel from Paul while he was in Ephesus, and then Epaphras took the gospel back to his hometown of Colossae. He took this message, this good news he heard back to his own city, and there he began to preach, he began to teach about this, this grace of God that he had received. When he got back, when he preached, when he taught about it, the people began to receive it, they began to believe it, and, and now sometimes later Epaphras has traveled to Rome to, tell, to fill Paul in on what's happening. That's where we find ourselves here. Paul is writing to the church. He's saying, Epaphras has arrived. He's told me about how things are going there. He's told me about your faith. He's told me about your love. He's told me about how you accepted the gospel. And now I'm writing to you to communicate some things that I'm concerned about. Now, that's all we're going to look at this morning as far as the, as far as the text goes. But really, when I look at this text, when I kind of stand back from it and get the high view... The theme of this opening section, the theme of the few verses we just looked at, though it's never explicitly stated, really the theme here is the wonder and the work of the gospel. What the gospel does. 
The gospel, if you will, is the root system from which all Paul wrote in, in verse six begins to, in these six verses begins to spring. Everything at the root of these, these six verses we just read, it's all about the gospel. The gospel came to you. You were given faith. You believed. You began to love the saints. The gospel was what told you about the hope that's laid up for you. The gospel was what you received. The gospel is spreading throughout the whole world. The gospel is being productive. It's with that thought in mind, I want to just point out to you, and I say this, and I mean this, five brief descriptions of the gospel that arrive out of this text. Now, I say brief, and, and this is only about a page of notes. I've got through four pages of notes, and I'm going to give you one page. Are you ready? <laughs> Some of you are looking like a calf at a new gate. He's already took this long, and now he's got five points. Number one, five things about the gospel that arrive from this text. Number one, the gospel is wonderful. Now, when I say wonderful, that doesn't hit you like it should. When I say wonderful, I don't mean in the same way we might say a meal or an evening out was wonderful. Our overuse of the word has really robbed the word of its true meaning. To say something is wonderful is to say it's magnificent, is to say it's majestic, is to say it's awe-inspiring. When I say it's wonder, the gospel is wonderful, I mean that the gospel, the object, the gospel creates a certain wonder in the heart. Just to look at it is almost overwhelming, hard to take in. The gospel is wonderful in that it is a wondrous mystery why God would be so kind and merciful toward us. Think about it, that verse we read earlier, that God reaches down and he pulls up the, he pulls up the poor from the ash heap, from the dung heap, and he sits them among princes. That's who God is, that he delights to reach down and lift the lowest up, lift them out. That in itself should cause us to be overwhelmed, amazed, and, and wonder at the mercy, the grace, the condescension of God. Imagine how this story must have been received by the Colossians when Epaphras began to first share it. Now you, I'd say just about everybody here, if not everybody here, you've heard the gospel your whole life, if not most of your life. And it's kind of become an old hat to you because you've heard it since you were a child. Like, like it said of Timothy, you've heard it since a child, the, the word that can make you wise in the salvation. But imagine hearing it for the first time in your 40s, in your 50s, in your 60s. Epaphras has been gone to Ephesus, and he comes back from Ephesus, and he begins to gather people, and he says, Look, I heard, while I was in Ephesus, I heard this man, his name was Paul. He shared a story that I thought, I thought was literally the sweetest story I'd ever heard. He, he, he shared a story day in and day out. He told this story of a God who rather than demanding we offer a sacrifice to him, he told us about a God who's offered a sacrifice for us. Remember, in this culture, they're offering sacrifices to appease and gain the favor of, of God. And then Epaphras says, but Paul, this guy Paul, he's telling us about a God who's not demanding sacrifice, but a God who's offered a sacrifice. And, and get this, guys, the sacrifice he offered was his only son. It wasn't a lamb, it wasn't a ram, it wasn't a goat. No, the sacrifice that Paul said that this God offered was his only son. And the reason he offered his son was because of our rebellion and our sin against him, we're separated against, from him. Paul said that, that God, this God, offered his only son to bring us into his family and to, to reunite us with him. And guys, this is what Paul told me. The amazing part about this story is not even just that, that, that God offered his own son for us. The amazing part about the story is that the son didn't stay dead. Three days after he was buried, he rose again to validate all that he had said to prove that the offenses of men against this one truly whole God had been paid for. Can you imagine hearing that story for the first time? It's hard for us to imagine it because we've heard it so much. What wonder, what awe, even if still in unbelief, this must have stirred up in the hearts of those who first heard it as Epaphras comes back and says, let me tell you about something that's changed my life. And what made it even more jaw-dropping was that this wasn't just a made-up story. The story was true. That brings me to the second description. Yes, it's wonderful, but the second description is the gospel is also truthful. Now, the story is amazing. That's great. But what makes it even more wonderful, more amazing, is it's true. Twice in the text, verse 5 and 6, Paul referred to the gospel as the truth. 
It's not a man-made story. This is not a fabricated fairy tale created to entertain children or even created to entertain adults. The gospel is universal truth. No matter where you go, in what culture, no matter what's going on around you, the gospel is the central truth in the universe that God himself has offered himself as a sacrifice to redeem mankind. It's better than my truth or your truth. It's God's truth. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1, he's looking back as he writes to the church and the scattered church, and he, he says, look, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We didn't tell you about something that was made up. Peter says, I was an eyewitness of his majesty. Verse 17 of 2 Peter 1, he said, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Peter recollects back to that night on the mountain as they saw the glory of God manifest, as they saw the Shekinah, as they heard God himself say of Jesus, This is my beloved Son. Peter says this isn't a made-up story. We saw the glory of God on Jesus. I'm not telling you something I heard from somebody else. I'm telling you something I saw. He says, we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Paul has had a similar experience on the way to Damascus. You know, he, he's on the way to Damascus. He's going to persecute, to, to jail, to even kill believers. And on the way to Damascus, God himself stops Paul. He knocks him off his horse. He shines such a bright light of his glory that Paul is blinded. And, and, and Paul says, who are you, Lord? You, you know the whole story. You know how Paul came to faith. Imagine Paul telling Epaphras, look, at one time I didn't believe this about Jesus. But I had an encounter with God. I saw it with my own eyes. Jesus really is risen from the dead and it changed my life. You see, the gospel was, the gospel is not a bedtime story. It is a life-altering reality. It's wonderful, but it's chiefly wonderful because it's truthful. It's wonderful, it's truthful. And that makes it number three, that makes it powerful. It was the gospel, not a program, that had transformed Paul. It was the gospel, not a program, that had transformed Epaphras. And it was the gospel, not a program, that had transformed these Colossians from sinners to saints, as we saw last week. The gospel itself is, is powerful. It's like dynamite. In Romans chapter 1, Paul wrote to the church, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. This good news is powerful news. Why? Because verse 17, Paul says, Romans chapter 1, In it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. What Paul is saying, the righteousness of God is revealed in that he gives his righteousness to sinners. He has judged sin in Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus fully paid the penalty for sin. God judged all our sin in Christ, and he gives his righteousness to those who come to him by faith. The gospel is powerful because that message in itself is astounding. The gospel is the only weapon we need in our arsenal. Today we're being told, well, the church needs this, the church needs that. No, what the church needs is the gospel. It's, we're like Barney Fife. We got one bullet, and it's the only one we shoot over and over and over. The gospel is the only weapon we need in our arsenal. It can blow up any obstacle. It can blow down any wall. The gospel can soften a rock when people begin to hear that God died for you in your rebellion while you were yet sinners, while you were spitting in his face, while you were crying out, crucify him. He was dying for you. That softens even the hardest heart. The gospel is powerful. It doesn't need to be reinforced by human philosophy. It doesn't need to be strengthened by human charisma. It only needs to be unleashed on the world. It is the power that makes it hopeful. Number four, the gospel is hopeful. And it's because it's powerful, it's hopeful. Paul spoke specifically of the hope laid up for them in heaven. This hope that they received when they first received it, this good news... One of the reasons the gospel is so powerful is that it offers hope where everything else leaves a man hopeless. I'm not against programs to try to help people break addictions, but what about when you've tried every program and that addiction still has such a hold on you and you cannot get loose from it? 
What about, what about a relationship that you have tried and tried and tried to fix and because of, of past sins, because of past offenses, you cannot reconcile it, you can't make it right? See, the gospel is the only thing that offers hope still when hope in every other area, the promise of hope in every other area has been, ha, has been used up. One of the reasons the gospel is powerful is that it offers hope in every single area of hopelessness. Let me give you a, a little hint here. If you want to be more productive in your personal evangelism, listen long enough to find out where people are hopeless and then tell them how the gospel applies to that area of their life. The gospel offers the assurance of forgiveness to the sinner. It offers restoration to the broken. It offers kinship to the lonely. It offers redemption to those who are longing for a better world and a better creation. The gospel offers hope in every single segment and area of human life. It was not these aspects of hope, however, that Paul was primarily addressing in verse 5. What Paul was primarily addressing was the promise of an inheritance laid up for the saints in heaven. It was this promise that occupied his mind. You have hope because God is laying away an inheritance for you. You see, the gospel provides hope in both life and in death. Because think about it. In life you have hope. You have hope of reconciliation, hope of forgiveness. But even in death you have hope because God, is a, God has a layaway plan in which he himself is, is going to assure your eternal well-being. The gospel administers to every area of human need. To the addict, the gospel introduces a chain breaker. To the one without a family, the gospel offers a father and an eternal multitude of siblings. For the sinner, the gospel provides a savior. For the sick, a physician. For the low, a lifter. For the outcast, an insider. For the poor, a benefactor. For the dying, life. For the confused, wisdom. For the hurting, healing. For the bashful, boldness. For the naked, a covering. For the oppressed, justice. For the weak, strength. For the blind, sight. For those in darkness, light. For those tempted, sympathy. And for those with any other need, the supplier of every other need. The gospel can meet everyone where they are in their hopelessness. The gospel is hopeful because it is the message of a Messiah who has come to establish a new kingdom in a new world, but most importantly, inhabited by a new people. The gospel gives hope because the gospel is a message not only that God forgives us, but that God redeems us and God changes us. He not only takes our penalty of sin away, but the gospel gives hope because he is personally sanctifying us now. And it gives us hope that one day he will finish that work of sanctification. We will be perfect never again to deal with sin and all of its effects. The gospel gives hope because it addresses every effect the sin has left on the world. The depth of the gospel will never be fully mined. We can pick away at it until the coming of Christ. And still we will not exhaust the riches of assurance, comfort, and hope the gospel offers. The gospel is hopeful. Fifth, finally, and I told you I wouldn't be long. Number five, finally, the gospel is fruitful. Just as certainly as it was bearing fruit among the Colossians, the gospel was simultaneously bearing fruit throughout the whole known world. Remember, Paul says to them, just as the gospel came to you and bore fruit, right now it's bearing fruit throughout the whole world. Wherever the gospel seed is sown, fruit is sure to follow. In every field where the gospel seed is being planted, a harvest will eventually be reaped. Now, I did not say that every seed will germinate. But I did say that every field in which the seed is being planted, a harvest will be reached. In every area where the gospel seed is being sown, there will be people of God called to God and saved for the glory of God. In every seed, where every field where the gospel is being planted, a harvest will eventually be reaped. Not every seed will germinate, but many seeds certainly will. Why? Because the gospel has life in itself. It's a living seed. When the seed is planted, when I plant my, my garden... Unless I plant it in some sort of clear plastic, I can't see when the seed germinates. I can't see when the seed germinates, but I can tell when it has because a little green shoot pops up on top of the, on top of the earth. It was the same way with the Colossians. Paul, Epaphras, couldn't see. When he began to preach the gospel, he couldn't necessarily see when the seed had germinated. But he could tell that the seed had germinated, that there was life because there was love. When the seed is planted, you can't always see when it germinates. However, just because we can't see it working doesn't mean it isn't. You remember Jesus described the working of the gospel in Matthew chapter 13. In verse 33, Jesus said, another parable, Jesus spoke to them. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. 
Now, usually in the scripture, leaven is symbolic of evil. It's symbolic of the flesh, symbolic of sin. But here, Jesus uses it to show how the kingdom of God works. Just like leaven placed in, in a pile of dough, you can't see it, but that leaven spreads throughout the dough, and it leavens the whole lump, if you will. In the same way, the kingdom of God, once the seed has been planted, you can't always see the movement of God, the working of the Spirit, but the kingdom of God spreads, though often unseen, into hearts and throughout the world as the gospel is proclaimed. You know what this tells me? This is good news. We don't have to be experts. We don't have to be botanists on plant growth. All we have to do is sow a seed. You get so afraid about sharing the gospel with people because you're so afraid you don't have the right answer or, or you're going to say something wrong. You don't have to be a botanist. You don't have to be an expert. The seed itself is alive. The seed itself is powerful. And all you have to do is say, look, I know that Jesus is alive. I know that Jesus really is God in human flesh. You don't have to be able to answer every question. If you plant the seed, the seed has life and it will germinate. I think about the old story, Johnny Appleseed. You know, think about Johnny Appleseed. You know, he went all throughout North America planting apple trees everywhere he went. The thing is, when Johnny Appleseed threw those seeds out, you could not immediately tell where he had been, but years down the road you could. And it's the same way with the gospel. As we throw out those seeds, you don't automatically always see, see immediate germination. But I guarantee you, if you throw out seeds years down the road, there will be a grove where the seeds were left. The trees were evidence of where Johnny Appleseed had been. So the fruit of love, the fruit of faith, is an evidence of where the gospel has been sown. I think about Paul, and it makes me think the seeds that we sow may produce groves in other places. Paul sowed one seed in the life of a man, we think. Paul sowed one seed in the life of a man, Epaphras. Epaphras then took and sowed a handful of seeds in Colossae. Then we don't know out of Colossae who took the gospel into other areas, but we know that by, by what happened in Ephesus, the entire province of Asia in Rome was evangelized, and it started with single seeds being planted. You may plant a single seed, and that single seed might turn into a grove of trees. Benson's telling me it's time to be done, so I will. <laughs> Think about this. If Paul was the one who won Epaphras, as Paul's sitting in this Roman house arrest, if Paul was the one who won Epaphras, he saw that his ministry was still bearing fruit even when he was confined. Even though he was confined, the gospel wasn't. When the seed is sown, it will in time bear much fruit. Because it is truthful, the gospel is powerful. Because it is powerful, it is hopeful. Because it's hopeful, it's fruitful. And because of all these things, can we say it's anything less than wonderful? The gospel is the glorious story of God. It's the true record of heaven reaching down to those who could never reach high enough to pull themselves up. The problem is we have sadly become callous to the story because of our constant exposure. So the sad reality is I can stand here and preach the gospel this morning and there are probably people sitting here this morning thinking, I wish he'd have preached something else, something to help me this week. But see, the gospel is what helps you this week. It is the fact that God is with us now, that God is laboring in us now. That's all part of this story, the gospel. The gospel is the good news. And it's not just good news for people that have never heard it. It's good news for people that have heard it a thousand times. We've sadly become callous to the story because of our constant exposure. But I, I guarantee you, if you will take the time this week to give the gospel full consideration, it will be to you like the news of the Colossians was to Paul. It will be water to a thirsty soul. It will literally be like good news from a far country. Because the gospel doesn't just affect you at the moment of salvation. The gospel affects every area of your life. The gospel is an awe-inspiring wonder to behold. And I challenge you this week, take some time again mining into the gospel and see how not just it affected you when you came to faith, but it continues to affect you as you live out the faith. Father, now I pray that you'll take your word. And Lord, I pray that you would use it to encourage your people to again plant ourselves deeply in the gospel. Lord, we're not trying to get to the good stuff. The gospel is the good stuff. The good news is the good stuff. The gospel is what gives me power to get up out of bed in the morning and fight sin. The gospel is what gives me hope for the future. The gospel, even when everything around us is shaking, gives us firm ground to stand on. Lord, help us to plant ourselves, to root ourselves deeply in the gospel. 
to be a people who don't just use the word flippantly like Christians do, but a people who genuinely cherish and love this good news we have in Christ.